20 years ago in 2003, Michael Lewis published Moneyball, a book about underdogs, innovation, and new approaches to the statistical evaluation of athletic performance in baseball. The book sparked controversy, conversation, and its message eventually impacted not just baseball, but other professional sports and non-athletic fields. Moneyball changed baseball by accelerating the arrival of young, data-savvy professionals who took over the operation of ball clubs and their front offices. The book inspired a film by the same name starring Brad Pitt, which is widely regarded as one of the best baseball movies ever made. Today, the word Moneyball is synonymous with rationalizing an established industry, and 20 years later, people are still reading the book, which speaks to Michael Lewis's literary gifts and the incredible story he found in Oakland, California, with its universal themes that resonate far beyond baseball. In this video, I want to talk about what made the book so compelling, controversial, and important. Let's talk about Moneyball, a book that changed baseball. Batting average, fielding percentage, and earned run average are among the statistics Americans have used to evaluate the performance of Major League Baseball players since 1871. As a result, the data available to fans and researchers alike is truly massive. Another aspect of professional baseball, going back to its earliest days, is the fact that former players coached, managed, and scouted the prospects, which meant there was a general lack of outside perspectives in decision making. Uh, this is not to say big league managers lacked insight into baseball, they did, but they also inhabited a relatively closed system and one not especially open to new knowledge. In the aftermath of World War II, more Americans than ever went to college, thanks to the GI Bill, and that generation of better educated baseball enthusiasts created the Society for American Baseball Research in 1971, an organization dedicated to researching baseball topics using statistics. One of the society's earliest members was a man named Bill James. After completing his military service, James graduated from the University of Kansas with degrees in English and economics and began writing about baseball. He proposed interesting questions few others were asking at the time. For instance, can we project the performance of teams and players based on their ages and past performances? Which pitcher and catcher combination is the best at deterring base dealers, and which one is the worst? James coined the term sabermetrics to mean the empirical analysis of baseball with the prefix saber coming from the Society for American Baseball Research. One important thing to know about Bill James and other sabermetric researchers is that they paid attention to context. That is to say, if you want a more complete understanding of a pitcher or a hitter's performance, you ought to account for the era they lived in and the ballpark they played in. Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, for instance, favors pitchers, while Fenway Park in Boston favors hitters. Similarly, batting averages were much higher in the 1930s and much lower in the 1960s during an era of dominant pitchers, such as Sandy Koufax. Bill James and others pointed out that certain time-worn methods of evaluating player performance were crude because they lacked precision. For instance, a pitcher's record of wins and losses is a very poor measure of performance because some teams don't score often. So sabermetricians developed fielding independent pitching, or FIPS, as a measure of what pitchers can control, walks, strikeouts, hit batters, and home runs. They also justified the metric because some pitchers have slower substandard defenders who are more error prone, slower to reach the ball, and capable of making fewer assists. Similarly, sabermetricians paid close attention to on-base percentage as opposed to just batting average because some players have relatively low batting averages but relatively high on-base percentages due to their plate discipline. They see a lot of pitches, draw a lot of walks, and wear out the defense in the process. And not making outs and hitting for power are two of the most desirable qualities in any hitter. One implication of a statistical approach to player evaluation was focusing less on the players' bodies. John Cruck was an exceptionally skilled hitter, even though he didn't look like an athlete. Pablo Sandoval possessed lightning reflexes at third base, 
And yet, you wouldn't necessarily think such a big guy could move so fast, but he could. Most people know that baseball players come in all shapes and sizes. Little guys and big guys have played Major League Ball since the game's inception. But some prospects have surely been overlooked because of their appearance. Scouts are very good talent evaluators, but they're also human beings with biases like the rest of us. And they might overlook a fat third baseman or a pitcher who doesn't throw in a conventional way or lacks a dominating fastball. The sabermetric focus on numbers insulated it from visual bias. That is to say, if you see a tall, attractive high school player, athletic and confident, you might assume his future greatness. But what if that vivid player does not possess the mental fortitude to perform at the highest level under pressure, while an oddly shaped, slightly overweight player does? Here's Michael Lewis talking about a major moment during the researching of his book when he saw the 2002 Oakland A's naked showering after a game. And what he saw was shocking. So he went to speak with the team's assistant general manager. And I said, I just saw your guys naked. And I said, if you line, and I said, it was, it was so such a strange sight I, that I thought to myself, if you line all those naked bodies up against the wall and ask anybody what they did for a living, nobody would guess professional athlete. And he said, he says, you kind of stumble on part of, the, part of our story. And the story is we're in the market for players who, who the market misvalues in some way. And one of the chief sources of misvaluation is physical appearance. Right. A good looking player will be overvalued and an ugly player will be undervalued. Something else was happening during the 1980s and 1990s just south of Oakland in California's Silicon Valley. During the 1980s, entrepreneurs oversaw the manufacture of personal computers and wrote software that would change the American economy. The digital revolution underway coincided with folks like Bill James, who wanted to develop superior forms of player analysis. Now, personal computers were becoming available and there was more computing power to manage larger data sets and con conduct empirical analyses. What sabermetricians could show to anyone willing to listen in the 1990s is that the ability to steal bases had become relatively overvalued, on base percentage had become relatively undervalued, and the market for relief pitchers lacked rationality. This does not mean baseball lacked excitement only that the sport had developed market inefficiencies, ranging from what the players got paid to how games got managed to the way organizations used their draft picks. One franchise, the Oakland Athletics, exploited these market distortions during the second half of the 1990s. But first, a bit about the A's general manager during this era and why Oakland's front office decided to do things so differently. Billy Bean was a first round draft pick with the New York Mets. In high school, he excelled in baseball and football, so much so that he declined a full-ride scholarship to play football at Stanford University so he could sign with the Mets. Everyone assumed the handsome young prospect from San Diego was on a fast track to the big leagues. But it didn't quite work out that way. Billy lacked the confidence of his peers and struggled reaching the major leagues. The boyish smile on his baseball cards belies a frequently frustrated kid. From the Mets, he moved to the Minnesota Twins and then on to the A's. In Oakland, he decided to ask the team's general manager, Sandy Alderson, his mentor, for a scouting job. And with that, Billy found a role in baseball that suited him. Less than a decade later, in 1998, he was named the Oakland A's new general manager. Well, Billy may have been a marginal major league ball player, but he turned out to be a brilliant GM, imaginative and cunning, and someone who could assemble winning teams despite the limited payroll of his franchise. One reason Bean embraced sabermetric analysis was purely competitive. He couldn't compete against big market teams like the Yankees and Red Sox in terms of payroll. Another reason was the simple fact that fewer people in Oakland questioned his unconventional methods or demanded ownership fire him. His small market was an advantage, it offered more flexibility. 
And yet other small, small market GMs, men who faced the same financial constraints as Billy, didn't emulate his approach. Here, it's helpful to know Bean's background. To him, drafting players out of college with demonstrated records made perfect sense. Using draft picks on untested high schoolers made little sense. He was one of those untested high schoolers. Well, the sabermetric magic worked. From 2000 to 2003, the A's dominated the American League Western Division and reached the postseason every year. Strangely, no one in baseball seemed particularly interested in why the A's had performed so well during the regular season with so little money. Enter Michael Lewis, a supremely gifted storyteller and author of many acclaimed nonfiction books. Well, he wanted to know what was going on in Oakland. Here is Lewis talking to Conan O'Brien in 2014 about the period before he wrote Moneyball. The curious thing is how slow seemingly really competitive environments are to react to someone who got who has a good new idea. You'd think, kind of like in theory, if someone comes along and builds a better widget, then the whole world goes and uses the better widget and, you, and everybody, all the other widgets are put out of business. Um, but take Moneyball. I mean, when I rolled into Billy Bean's office and it was 2002, he'd been doing this. He'd been winning all sorts of baseball games with no money for five or six years. And nobody in baseball cared to know what he was doing. I mean, nobody. They just, there was no curiosity about it at all. Like, so Michael Lewis gets in touch with the A's front office and then something incredible happens. Billy Bean, the general manager, grants Michael Lewis, a total outsider, unfettered access to his players, scouts, and analytics department. For an entire season, Lewis got to see how the sausage was made, how the A's drafted prospects and targeted free agents, how their game strategy differed from other teams. Why did Billy grant this access? Well, I think he wanted to show someone. He wanted to show someone his unique approach, and he assumed relatively few people would care. After all, he'd been doing the same thing for years. But Bean didn't know who, who he was dealing with. Michael Lewis asked all the right questions and zeroed in on the right characters to tell a compelling story. He made sabermetrics interesting and accessible while crafting a story about underdogs beating a system stacked against them. It's no coincidence that so many of his books have been turned into Hollywood blockbusters since 2009, the first being The Blind Side starring Sandra Bullock. The resulting book, Moneyball, with its fantastic subtitle, The Art of Winning an Unfair Game, purported to show how the A's could have won more games than the New York Yankees with one third of the payroll. Moneyball became an instant smash, a bestseller and subject of controversy and criticism. Critics said that the book hardly mentioned the team's three ace pitchers, Barry Zito, Mark Mulder, and Tim Hudson, who were so essential to the A's success. Similarly, the A's best hitter in 2002 and the American League MVP, shortstop Miguel Tejada, did not receive significant attention in the book. Lewis's response to those charges was twofold. First, he explained that he wanted to write a book about the team's overlooked players, their undervalued players, men like Scott Hatterberg and Chad Bradford. Second, Billy Bean had drafted the team's ace pitchers based on his innovative money ball approach. Folks in the baseball establishment claimed the book offered very little insight into the actual art of winning baseball games because players make unseen intangible contributions to success. A fair enough accusation. And Billy Bean failed to grasp what really mattered during the high pressure postseason when his teams didn't do especially well. One vocal critic, Hall of Fame second baseman Joe Morgan, almost certainly didn't read the book, but he and others strongly disliked its core message. That the baseball establishment, including star players, Hall of Famers, did not understand certain aspects of the game. And on top of that, you have Major League Baseball's conservative tendencies, its traditional tendencies. Here is Michael Lewis explaining the strong reaction to his book. If someone comes along into baseball and says, uh, all, these, all these players are valuable and you don't know it, um, everybody who's in baseball and, may, and been making baseball decisions 
is by implication, has by implication made a lot of bad decisions. So there was hostility to Moneyball in that sense, as well as from people who realized they could lose their jobs. But if the baseball establishment didn't like the book, it was very well received by others. Farhan Zaidi, a Canadian citizen born to Pakistani parents, read Moneyball while earning his doctorate in economics at the University of California, Berkeley, and it changed the direction of his life. Zaidi hadn't played baseball as a boy, but now he wanted a job in sports management, and he quickly established himself as a sharp analytical mind, first in the Oakland A's organization before moving on to the Los Angeles Dodgers and his current position with the San Francisco Giants. That's one of Moneyball's effects. It inspired a whole cohort of smart, data-minded individuals to pursue careers in the front offices of sports franchises. And these new executives displaced part of the old baseball establishment. Owners were paying attention to. The best example, the most noteworthy example, is John Henry, a self-made millionaire and entrepreneur who bought the Boston Red Sox in 2002 and decided he wanted to adopt much of Bean's philosophy. Except he could spend over $100 million on player salaries. The year before Moneyball's publication, John Henry actually hired Bill James and named a 28-year-old kid named Theo Epstein the team's general manager. Well, you know who Bill James is, but who was this fresh-faced 20-something overseeing the team's trades and contracts? The Red Sox new general manager had attended Yale University. After graduation, he got a job working for the San Diego Padres. In San Diego, a mentor encouraged him to attend law school so he could understand the growing complexities of Major League Baseball contracts, which he did. So Epstein's pedigree and background made him a very different and formidable kind of GM. Coolly rational, trained in law, and open to any mathematical insight about baseball. Well, Epstein oversaw two world championships in Boston, and New England's passionate fan base rejoiced mightily. Then he accepted a position with the Chicago Cubs, and that franchise won its first World Series in over 100 years. Theo Epstein represents a trend. Since 2003, baseball franchises have brought in smart whiz kids without experience as professional athletes to run things. Farhan Zaidi is one example, as is the Marlins' new GM Kim Ong, the highest ranking female executive in baseball. Now it's true that the analytics revolution would have come to baseball with or without Moneyball, but Lewis's book accelerated the process. It popularized sabermetric terms like on-base percentage and range factor. It transformed front offices fast and other professional sports such as soccer, cricket, basketball, and hockey. They took notice of the book. They wanted to, to derive advantage from the story. How were their fields of competition inefficient? Moneyball became synonymous with challenging any inefficient industry and rationalizing it. Since the book's publication, new technology has made measuring player performance even more precise. Pitch FX, rolled out in 2007, could measure the trajectory, spin, break, and location of pitched balls. In 2015, high-tech cameras were placed in every major league ballpark, and what these cameras capture is dizzying. The spin rate of pitched balls, the speed of base runners, the efficiency of a fielder's route to the ball. Teams now pay attention to the exit velocities and launch angles of batted balls, not just batting average. StatCast demonstrated precisely where hitters were likely to hit the ball, and as a result teams began radically shifting defenders, and it all worked. Batting averages went down, strikeouts went up, and players are now focused on hitting the ball hard at statistically optimized angles. Unfortunately, the most efficient optimized baseball games aren't necessarily the most fun to watch, because you're likely to see more strikeouts and fewer hits. Michael Lewis and Billy Bean did not invent pitch FX or StatCast, but they became associated with a moneyballification of the game that made it, at least to some people, boring. In 2023, this year, Major League Baseball rolled out rules to speed up the game and stop defensive shifting. But let's go back to the book. 20 years later, 
Moneyball is still a bestseller. It's known internationally and it, and it inspired a highly successful motion picture. Many people regard the film version as the best baseball movie ever made. In 2018, the Library of Congress invited Michael Lewis to speak about his best known piece of nonfiction and such accolades, at least in my humble opinion, are deserved. Moneyball is not just about baseball. It's about thinking differently when everyone thinks the same. It's about undervalued people, systemic bias, and innovation. It's a story with universal resonance. Hey, thanks for watching this one. Let me know what you think in the comments. Is there another book that had such a similarly outsized impact on baseball?